Hi. Welcome to the Eternity Online Service. So glad you could join us today. We're Dave and Rosanna Palmer, and it's so great to have your company. And we ask God that He would touch you, speak to you, and guide you in your life, and that you'll get so much out of today's service. But before we go any further, let's just give Him all the glory and all the praise as we just sing together.
Praise the Lord. Great praising God together. And now we want to pray for you and we want all of us to pray for each other. We pray that your need would be met this day. God is listening to your every prayer. God loves you and he desires to answer your prayers. Father, today we open our hearts before you and we ask, Lord, that you would touch every person that's listening or watching or participating in this church service. Yes. And we're asking today, Father, that you would grant them the desires of their heart, mm -hmm. that you would pour upon them your spirit, flood them with your revelation and life, and allow them to see the opportunities and the open doors you've given them, and to understand the big picture that the eternity with you is worth going through what we have to go through in this short time called life on earth. Speaking of desires of your heart, God does desire to meet your need and the things that you desire because often our desires are birthed out of our relationship with God. Amen. And we, we sometimes think, oh, I can't ask for that or this. God says, come on. We are his kids. He loves us. And there are things that you would like to pray for and you hold back. But God says, come on, trust me, I've got something for you. And I want to pray today, especially for somebody you've been experiencing heart palpitations, you know, arrhythmias or whatever it's called. Your heart hasn't been beating properly. 
Today, Father, we ask that you would supernaturally work in that situation mm. yeah. and bring an end to that problem in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Yes, and for someone else, your breathing has just been a bit weird. And I just declare that your breathing will come back to normal. It may be an anxiety thing that's causing you to not be able to breathe properly, but I just declare that that breathing problem will be fixed in the name of Jesus. I pray for just deep breathing, for the peace of God to just fill your heart and that all anxiety goes in the name of Jesus and that that will all be restored to normality in Jesus' name. There's somebody watching right now and your calf muscles, the ones on the front of your calf, have been cramping at night time, the ones that pull your foot upwards. And it's very painful and very hard to deal with it. So we're going to commit this to prayer. Father, we pray for this person right now and ask, Father, for a supernatural solution to this problem. And we declare that by the stripes of Jesus, this person is healed. We declare that you are under the authority and the anointing of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. You are not under the kingdom of darkness. You've yeah. been moved out. And we declare this cramping must mm -hmm. stop. It must leave your foot and your leg right now and go in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I'm praying for someone and it's like your, all your nerves just feel on edge. And I just pray in the name of Jesus for that sensation to stop in Jesus' name. I pray, Father, that you just touch them by the power of your spirit, cause that sensation to stop and for things to function Normally, those nerves will not feel on edge any longer. They are healed in Jesus' name. The root cause of that problem, be healed in Jesus' name. There's somebody watching right now and you've really desired that God's glory would be manifested in your home. And God is saying to you today, yes, I've heard the desire of your heart. I've heard what it is that you desire. And the answer is yes. I will come and make my home with you. I'll manifest myself to you and the glory of God shall be seen and it will be so clear and so strong, but you might not be aware of it because it rises around you like the tide coming in or like the proverbial frog in the kettle and that glory will just get stronger and stronger until all those that come under your roof will come under the glory and the dominion of Jesus. It's going to stop the fighting, it's going to stop the swearing and it's going to cause people to be convicted and drawn to God. So the answer for you today is yes. God says, I've given you my glory that you might be one. I just pray once again for those that are battling with cancer. And particularly for someone who's perhaps been given the diagnosis of cancer, do not let your mind be bombarded with all the negative things that we know and have heard, but put your trust in God. God desires healing. And it's so easy to get your mind just to get filled with fear and all the things that could happen. But let's just agree together, those cancer cells must go in the name of Jesus. Cancer be healed in Jesus' name. And we declare the positive report from his word that by your stripes you were healed. And we just continue to stand on that, that the price that Jesus paid on the cross was enough for cancer in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. I want to pray today for all those that have got lost loved ones and people that haven't yet come to Jesus or come and re or have surrendered to him. And we pray now, Father, for all those family members and even close associates and yes. friends. And we're asking today, Father, for you to move in their lives. We claim conviction over their sin. We pray, Father, that their eyes would be opened yeah. and that the blindfolds of the enemy would be removed. I declare that angels are helping set up gospel encounters for them. And I pray, Father, that they would be born again, filled with the Holy Spirit and come under the direct influence of God and get into fellowship with good people and leave all the worldliness and people of wrong influence behind and fix their focus on Jesus and move forward in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. So I pray now as we just continue on with the service and continue to worship God 
who is the source of the answer to every prayer, just continue to receive. Continue to let your requests be known to him, but continue to just give him all the glory and all the worship as we continue to sing. was a wretch I remember who I was I was lost I was blind I was running out of time sin separated the breach was far too wide but from the far side of the chasm you held me in your sight so you made a way across the great divide Left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside And there at the cross you paid the debt I owed Broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time I had hope Thank you Jesus for the blood applied Thank you Jesus you have washed me white Thank you Jesus you have saved my life Brought me from the darkness into glorious light You took my place laid inside my tomb of sin You were buried for three days but then you walked right out again and now death has no sting and life has no end for i have been transformed by the blood of the lamb thank you jesus for the blood applied thank you jesus you have washed me white stronger than the wonder-working power of the blood, the blood that causes sons and daughters, we are ransomed by to glorious light. <laughs> 
Charlotte Fear, Drive, Divide or Die Virtue. A lot of people are really struggling. There is a bombardment on people's minds which is affecting their lives. Don't let your mind take you on a journey that you should not go. Pull in the reins if you recognize a pattern of destructive flow. You'll go into the direction that your mind is taking you. This is certainly a time to really grab hold of some of the promises of his word. 2 Timothy 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. With all the weird concepts constantly being thrown at us, we can still travel this journey with safe thinking. We can have good judgment, disciplined thought patterns, and the ability to understand and make right decisions. In the face of fear, we can still make right decisions as we remember that within us, we have the power of God. We have the mind of Christ and therefore we can make wise choices. We are designed to live in relationship with God who loves us. We do not have to be overcome by the fear that is being thrown at us, but we can overcome. 1 John 5, 4 says, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. I want to encourage you not to allow fear to drive you, divide you or divert you at this time. Don't let fear drive you into making rash or wrong decisions they may not be as easy to reverse as you might think. Keep your trust in God. Don't let fear divide you from the community that can help you and encourage you when you need it. There are people around you who love you and want to see you do well. And don't let fear divert you from fulfilling your purpose in God. The Bible says that perfect love casts out all fear Fear involves torment. We have an enemy that desires to torment us and this causes us to make mistakes. It causes us to make mistakes in our decisions and to also be in flight mode. We need to remind ourselves that God is love. He loves you and he can get you through every situation. You can overcome everything that comes against you. Life is a challenge. It's not always comfortable. We can't always anticipate the shape or form that these challenges will present themselves. But we do know for certain that challenges and vexing storms will come. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't 
collapse because it is built on bedrock. The earth trembles, thunders quake, bolts of lightning, mountains shake, the heavens part and you come down, your mighty voice it does resound. When the tough times come, remind yourself that they do not stay. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. We can make a difference in this world if we keep going. Would rocks cry out to worship? Whose glory taught the stars to shine? Perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing, but this joy is mine. With the thousand hearts. We magnify your name You alone deserve the glory The honor and the praise Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more Who else would die for us? Resurrection means our rise. There isn't time enough to sing of all you've done, but I have eternity to try. With the
Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. Jesus' teaching on the straight and narrow. Note the way the word straight is spelled. That's not a misprint. It's not a typo, and I'll explain in a minute. So we're reading first from Matthew chapter 7, verses 12 to 14 in the New King James Version, and it says, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who are going in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. So let's pray. Father, as we look at the Bible today and we read your word, we're asking for your help to understand it. We ask that you will enlighten our minds and our spirits with your spirit of wisdom and revelation, that the eyes of our understanding might be enlightened, that we might know the hope to which you've called us and understand these things that you said and show us how to apply them in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, first, this little bit of confusion about the word straight. Normally, we think of the word straight as in a straight line, but it's spelled as S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T. -T. But I'm going to read now the King James Version, and you'll see what we often quote as the straight and narrow is actually spelled differently because it doesn't mean straight as in a straight line. It means straight as in a narrow passageway like the Straits of Magellan, the Straits of Humus, or Bass Strait. It's a narrow waterway when it's used in nautical terms. For us, in the King James, he means something very narrow and constricted and tight. Here we go. Matthew 7, 13 to 14 in the King James Version. And I'm going to translate it into today's language as I go to help us. Enter in at the straight gate. Note the spelling. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many are they which are going in that way. Because straight is the gate, narrow is the way, which could be translated as road or path, which leads to life, and few there be that find it. So we've got to aim for this narrow gate. This is what Jesus said in a similar passage in Luke chapter 13, reading from verses 23 to 28. And notice what he starts this off with. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? So he's talking here about salvation and about how to get salvation. Now remember, Jesus is really the only expert on eternal life and eternal matters and on eternal salvation. A lot of people have a lot of opinions but this is the opinion I'm listening to. I'm listening to what Jesus said. And this is what he says in answer to the question, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow gate. So he's talking about that narrow gate again. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. So this is saying that getting into salvation is not easy. Amen. I know Jesus said my yoke is easy, my burden is light, but getting through this doorway takes striving. And the word strive there means to give it 100% focus and effort. It's got the similar feeling to maybe an Olympic athlete training for the Olympics. That's how we should view this, getting into this narrow gateway. Amen. And then later on in the chapter, he goes straight into this statement, depart from me, all you workers of iniquity, for there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. Very scary statement, meaning that it's very easy to miss out and to get in is going to take 100% effort, focus, energy, and a determination to make it in. We've got to investigate this to find out. 
Now, for example, speaking of narrow doors and things hard to get in, Rosanna used to have a small car with two doors, and sometimes I'd get to drive it. Now, being a musician, I would head out there with a guitar over my shoulder, something for the office in one hand and a bag for gigs in the other hand, and I'd get to the door of the car, and sometimes I could get the door open, but when I looked and Rosanna had been driving, the seat was all the way forward, right up against the steering wheel. There's no way I could get in there, even to put the seat back, which I had to get into first, carrying all those things. I had to offload what I was carrying to focus 100% on getting in there, a bit like the proverbial camel going through the eye of a needle. So what can we learn today from Jesus' teaching on the straight and the narrow, the straight gate and the narrow path? And what is it? And we've got to find out where to find it. Because Jesus said, there are many who enter in the broad path, few get in the narrow gate and into the constricted path, and there's few who find it. And he's referring to the narrow gate. So we've got to find it. So this again is Matthew chapter 7, verses 12 to 14. Therefore in everything, whatever you want others to do to you, you do the same for them. For this is the objective of the law and prophets. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many are entering through it. How narrow is the gate and constricted is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. And then in brackets, the narrow gate. Amen. So this narrow gate is an exclusive entry point to get on the path to life. There is no other option. This is the only way Jesus has told us that we can enter the path of life. Amen. The other path might be easy to get onto, but it's full of destruction in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Jesus said, you have to find the gate. So let's think about this for a minute, just in the word of God, how we're going to find that gate. I'll come back to that in a minute. Next question we ask is, what is the constricted path? Remember Jesus said, narrow is the gate, constricted is the way that leads to life. And I know that some versions will say it's narrow in the King James, but the word would be much better translated as constricted. And it's like a road that's full of bumps, full of obstacles, and it's surrounded by enemies who are constantly shooting at you, constantly trying to blow you up, constantly trying to push you off the road. The best illustration I ever thought of for this is the good old-fashioned gauntlet. Way back in the day when the army or the soldiers need to discipline someone in the crew, instead of putting them in the prison where they wouldn't be any use as a soldier, they'd give them instant punishment. And everybody would line up in two rows, and they'd make this soldier get through there as best he could. And while he was going through, they'd be punching him and kicking him and yelling at him and treating him really badly and giving him all the torture they could while he was passing through so they would learn not to do it again. Now, we've got to remember, that's a picture of this narrow, constricted path. Amen. It's constantly constricted. We can think of a path with cliffs, with mountain lions, with enemies, with someone wanting to rob you and bash you, others hitting you, and all the tests and trials of life are along this road. Amen. We can do it. Jesus gives us the power to do it, but we've got to understand what it is he's talking about, because he said to strive to get on that, through that narrow door, and stay on that path. Amen. Now, for an illustration, I was just thinking of a time when I was a very young boy and my cousins used to live next door. They're all older than me and they were often getting up to mischief and I was tagging along. And so one day we got onto a vacant house block somewhere and it had blackberries growing on it, which you would often see in the country back in those days. And so they were all in there picking blackberries, but the blackberries were full of prickles. And so I was very small and I looked down and I saw another plant with some small blackberries on it. Not blackberries, but they were black and berries. And there were no prickles. So I started to eat them. I thought, this is much easier. It's much safer. 
Someone said to me, you shouldn't be eating them. And I said, no, this is much better. And I was eating them, not realizing that I was eating berries from the deadly nightshade plant. And after a while, mum and dad had to take me to the doctor because I was very crook. I could have killed myself doing that because it looked like an easy path. Amen. There was no constriction on that path. No prickles. You didn't have to reach your arm in. You could just pick them and eat them. But it was deadly. And this is like the broad road that leads to destruction. Many are going down that way, not realizing that at the end of that path is devastation, destruction, lost eternity and no rewards. Very, very dangerous. Now listen to what the Holy Spirit said through the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 4.18. And he said, if, now I want you to concentrate on the next phrase, it is hard for the righteous to be saved. I'll read it again. There it is. You can see it in the Bible. And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? It's not easy in this scripture. It's hard to be saved. If we want eternal salvation, which the Holy Spirit says is hard to obtain, we have no option but to be part of the few who dare to enter through the narrow gate and successfully traverse the constricted path. So how do we enter the narrow gate? The first thing we have to remember is that we can't enter it without striving. And I'm not talking about striving to be righteous in your own eyes. I'm talking about striving to obey Jesus and what he says. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? He said to them, strive to enter through the narrow gate. In other words, don't worry about anybody else. You've got to run your race and this is what it's going to take. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Later on, remember, he said, depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For who? Those that don't strive to enter through the narrow gate and stay on the constricted path. So what is the narrow gate? This is a crucial question which we have to answer because Jesus said, you've got to find the narrow gate. All right. How do we find it? Well, we start with a study of scripture. And the first thing we do, which is the easiest, is simply look at the context. Now, the immediate context of talking about the narrow gate and the constricted path is the verse before it. What did Jesus say just before that? He said, therefore, in everything, that's everything, whatever you want others to do to you, you do the same for them. For this is the objective of the law and prophets enter through the narrow gate. Now, when the Bible was written, it wasn't written with punctuation, and it certainly wasn't written with verse delineators in there. They're put there so that we can all find the same place at the same time. You know, let's open up to Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Well, we can all find it quickly in our Bibles. It's better than saying, now it's about three quarters of the way through. Where, what have you found? I, I found... Romans, well, you've gone too far. Go back. We'd be there all day trying to find it. That's why they are there. Now, if we take them out, then this is what it says. The narrow gate is the golden rule of love, which is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Amen. That's important. So he says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Enter by this narrow gate. This is the only way for us to find life is to keep living by the golden rule of love. Then all those other instructions written in the Sermon on the Mount could actually be held under this because Jesus says even all of the Old Testament can be boiled down to this simple statement. Whatever you want others to do to you, you do the same for them. Amen. That's taking the initiative to show love, and that's the narrow gate. It's also the path we have to walk down, and it's not going to be easy to stay exclusively on that path. Amen. Woo! So we've got to keep to that golden rule in every situation, how easy it is to justify other actions. 
You know, I've heard people say, we shouldn't have to be doormats. No, we just simply lay our life down by willfully doing it. We turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, pray for those that despitefully use you, bless those that curse you, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Why? Because what you sow is what you reap. If you want love in your future, you've got to sow love, etc. Amen. Now, if we look at a slightly wider context of what this narrow gate is, listen to what Jesus says in some of the lead up scriptures. This is, first of all, Matthew chapter 5, verses 39 to 48. So let's summarize this. Turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, give to anyone who asks you, love your enemies, bless those that curse you. Then in other places, Jesus says, if your brother says he repents, forgive him. Be compassionate, just as your father is also compassionate. Judge not, and you'll not be judged. Condemn not, and you'll not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given to you. And the Holy Spirit adds from the Apostle Paul in Romans 12, 21, overcome evil with good. Amen. So I want to encourage you today. We just found the narrow gate. We now understand what the constricted path is. And Jesus is saying, do your utmost best, 100% attention, 100% focus, and all the effort you've got to stay on that path and to get in through that narrow gate. It's not works righteousness, it's wisdom. Amen. So number three, how do we enter the gate? By striving. Amen. Jesus said it's obviously not easy. You've got to overcome your own flesh and natural selfish tendencies to stay on the path. Overcome the relentless wicked enemy assailing you all along the way, competing and trying to distract us from every step. So this is a, a challenge. It's a difficult challenge and we have to take up the challenge. This is why Jesus urges us to do all we can or strive to enter the narrow gate. There it is again, Luke 13, 24, strive to enter through the narrow gate for many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. We need constantly to remind ourselves that this is the only way to life. Now, everyone wants life. This is the way to life. The narrow gate and the constricted path leads to life. It's the only way that does. We know that people in the world try to get the feeling of life. They smoke something, inject something, drink something, take something. They're all trying to get it. Maybe they're going to eat chocolate, drink coffee, go out with some friends, watch a funny movie, trying to get that feeling of life. But when you obey Jesus and do things his way, there is this overflow of living water that bubbles up to eternal life. That's life. It's a zest for living. It's excitement. It's almost euphoria. It's just a great feeling when you do these things with Jesus. Amen. Now, we do need to do this with 100% effort, focus, intention, and perseverance. Why? This is because there's a warfare. Everything evil hates anything good. Satan will fight frantically with everything at his disposal to prevent us from doing the will of God on earth. Why? Because he's the God of this world. He wants to have his own kingdom here, the kingdom of darkness. Remember the Bible says, the whole world is under the power of the evil one. Very clearly said, the world system is under the power of the devil. And so that's his kingdom. And when we start to obey Jesus and try to go through the narrow gate, get onto that path, we are a great threat to the devil because whenever God is obeyed, the devil's kingdom is shrinking. So he's going to fight back. So he is vehemently opposed to allowing God to be obeyed here in any way. If God's will is done on earth, then God's kingdom rules on earth. Where God rules, Satan does not. Amen. It's simple mathematics. Our enemy fights frantically and brutally to preserve his kingdom. So when you get through that gate and you know what it is, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, then anything and 
everything evil is going to be against you staying on that path. That's like the gauntlet. You're going to get hammered from this side, abused from that side, persecuted from over here. Your flesh is going to scream at you. The world is going to say that's not the way to do it. Other people will say, if you give to those that ask you, you'll end up with nothing. It's a lie from hell. It's just trying to stop God's kingdom ruling here. If you obey Jesus, you live in the shadow of the Almighty. He abides with you and you have his glory and his manifestation and life. What do you want more? Amen. God will look after you and protect you. So number five today, drop whatever you must to squeeze in. Luke 13, 24, keep on struggling to enter through the narrow door because I tell you that many people will try to enter but won't be able to do so. Mark 10, 25, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. These are connected. And in one way to understand the eye of the needle, and it's just like my dad had. He had a factory when I was a little boy and it had a great big door on the front, but in the door was a tiny little door. And that's where you went in to unlock and then you'd pull the chain to pull the other door up. But that little door, some people say, is what they referred to as the eye of the needle. And when they came after the gates were shut, if they wanted to get their wares and their camels inside the city, they would have to go through this little gateway. And when they did, they couldn't do it with the camels fully loaded. Now, there's a lot of other versions of this too, so I'm just saying this one. And so they had to take everything off the camel, get him down on his knees, hello, and then he crawled through. And it's the same with us. If you're carrying a lot of stuff, you can't get in. I mentioned about me getting in the door of Rosanna's little car. I couldn't do it with everything I was carrying. And in the same house I'm thinking of, it was hot in the summer in Queensland. You just need the breeze to come through. So Rosanna and I had a house full of boarders and we had our own bedroom, obviously. And at times we'd prop that door of the bedroom open with a little rubber stopper. Now you had to prop it on very hard so that the breeze could come through, but nobody could see in and the wind's not going to bash the door shut or open. And then I'd be downstairs and I'd be making up some food or drinks or whatever. And I'd carry up all of these goods on a tray and I'd get to that door and I couldn't go through because it was a narrow door. I couldn't get through carrying all those things. And I had to think of a strategy and I would put it down, carry them in one at a time, take the tray in that way and then set it all up again. And then we could enjoy heaven on earth, enjoying breakfast in bed or whatever together. And that was the only way I could get in there. Of course, I could push the stopper out, but that would have ruined the illustration. Now, of course, at times we do have to carry things into our future, like the wise bridesmaids in the Bible, 10 of them, five didn't carry any extra oil, the other five did, and so there are things we do have to carry. Amen. So, number six today is, enter while the door is open. This is crucially important, and maybe we don't all realize this, and perhaps many in the world don't. I know that one of our friends got saved and we all got saved. He was in our band and he kept saying, oh, maybe I'll backslide for about five years and then I'll come back. I just want to live my life. I want to do all the stuff that young men want to do. And I said to him, I said, if you backslide, you won't be coming back in five years because you can't draw yourself to God. He draws you. And so I tried to talk him out of it. He wanted to do that. He wanted to do that. And I think after a while, he just went away. So let's read now what this says in Luke 13, 24 to 25. Do all you can to go in by the narrow door. A lot of people will try to get in, but will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and locks the door, you will be left outside. You will knock on the door and say, sir, open the door for us. But the owner will answer, I don't know a thing about you. Now, to understand this, we need to remember again that in the original languages, there's no full stops, no commas, and certainly no verse markers. So let's read this again without those things in it. A lot of people will try to get in, but will not be able to once the owner of their house gets up and locks the door. And so this is showing me 
why they couldn't get in. Because the owner locked the door. And he says, once the owner of the house gets up and locks the door, the word once in there implies that there's a time in which the door is open. Then the door is shut and you've got to get in while it's open. Amen. For example, let me just give you an illustration. If you're heading into the foyer of a hotel or an office building and you see the lift door open and then somebody in there sees you coming and they hold the door open for you, what do you do? Do you just dawdle around, smell the roses, say a few chats to someone and leave them holding the door? Or do you respond to that gesture of love by rushing and hurrying to go in the door because they're holding it open for you and saying thank you? What about if you held the car door open for someone? I know this happened to me at one stage in my life. I was in such a good habit of opening Rosanna's door for her. I was traveling with her brother one day and I went round to open the door for him but instead of appreciating and going in the door I opened, he went in my door in the driver's side <laughs> like he was going to drive. But I'm saying today, how long would you hold the door open for someone? If you open the door for your spouse, say you're a male and you say, I'm holding the door open for my darling to get in the car, and she sees it but doesn't come, doesn't say anything, she's playing with things in the house, she starts to sweep the floor or whatever, how long are you going to stay there holding the door open? A minute? Five minutes. That five minutes would be a long time to hold the door open. Ten minutes. What about an hour? Five hours. How long would you hold the door open? Because I think our response to someone holding a door open for us shows our heart. Amen? And Jesus is holding a door open for salvation. And the Bible is encouraging us, enter while the door is open. Because once he shuts the door, you'll be locked out. And then they start saying, let us in. They're knocking, boom, 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 boom. Let us in, let us in, let us in. And he says, I don't know you. I don't know where you're from. Now, I had to meditate on this for a long time. And then I realized that this comes down here to number seven. Make sure Jesus knows you. Let's read this in the Aramaic and the plain English. You'll be standing outside knocking up the gate and you will begin to say, Our Lord, our Lord, open to us, and he shall answer, and he shall say, I say to you, I don't know you, from where are you? I thought about this for a long time, and I realized that Jesus is familiar with the culture of where he's from. He's from heaven. In heaven, everybody loves. Everybody imitates the same Father. Everybody loves one another. There's politeness, there's love, there's people holding doors open and you go through and you're appreciative, people giving, receiving, just loving on one another. And when Jesus sees somebody who doesn't respond to his loving gesture of holding the door open, he says, I don't understand where you're from. I don't know the culture of your family. You certainly don't have the culture of my family where I'm from. That's why they're locked out. I don't know you. I don't know where you're from. So I want to encourage you today. We have to respond to the love of somebody who holds the door of salvation open to us. And we know what that gate and narrow path is all about now. And so I want to encourage you, if you haven't become a Christian, do so today. I'm going to lead you in a prayer in a minute. But I also want to encourage you to enter in to that narrow gate. You've got to find it. And I've given you a big help today by showing what's in the context of that statement. And it's all about love. And Jesus is saying we have to be perfect in love. In all those responses, you know, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, and all of those things, it says, be ye perfect or be perfect just as your heavenly Father is perfect or imitating him or being a replica of him or doing it his way. That's Jesus' definition of father and son. Amen. The son loves the father. The father loves the son, shows him all things, and the son does what he sees with the father. Now, I grew up with my father and I lived with him there till I was 20 or something. And I had to go away for university and that kind of thing. And then off in the band traveling. But I lived with him for around about 20 years. 
And one day my brother-in-law looked at me and he said, you walked in the room just like your father. Now, I know I did. And I said, thank you. I thought that was a very, very good compliment. But my father never did give me walking lessons. He didn't show me how to walk. And he didn't coach me in how to talk like him. He didn't coach me in, well, he did at times, how to work like him. But I learned by being there, by being in that family, being around the same table, being out there in the workplace with him, I learned and it just overflowed onto me. And I remember as a young man or a teenager, when dad would do something, it would be like, let me do it. Let me try it. Let me do it. I just wanted to do what he was doing. Now, there was only one thing he didn't let me learn, which was welding. I don't know why, but I learned everything else he did. He taught us how to make a straight fence. He taught me how to milk a cow. He taught me to not go in the bull paddock. He taught me all kinds of things about farming and about what we do. He only had to show us what to do, and we did it from then on. Rounding up the cows, milking the cows, doing the big wash up in the milking shed, all the stuff we had to do, I learned it by being there. And I had the culture of my father. I'd learned from him and I'd learned from my mother. And so my brother, my sister could say, I know who you are because you've got the same family culture I've got. And Jesus looks at someone who won't respond to an open door when he's holding the door of salvation open. And he says, I don't know you. And you know, a lot of times we tell people, Jesus knows you, he understands you, he knows all about your gifts. But we've got to remember, there's a couple of times in the Bible where he says, I don't know you. And we've got to make sure he knows us. And we find part of this in John chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Hear and follow. See things with Father and imitate them. That's the definition of Father and Son. And so today I want to encourage everybody, do what it takes to get in that narrow gate. 100% attention, 100% focus, effort, persistence, get onto that constricted path and fight like crazy to stay on it. No matter what your flesh says, no matter what the world culture says, and no matter what the devil throws at you and or any persecution that comes your way and criticisms and ridicule and put downs, be determined, I am going to do unto others as I would have them do unto me, no matter what. And Jesus says, that's the way to life, not destruction. Amen. So before we conclude, I want to pray for everybody. But first, I want to pray for you if you haven't yet surrendered your life to Jesus. It's the greatest thing you could do. He's holding the door open and you need to come in. And by coming in, you are saying, I want Jesus to be my Lord. And this begins with a prayer. The prayer is the easy part of this. Staying on the straight and narrow is the part that continues. But we can do it by the grace of God, by imitating our Father, doing what we see with Jesus. And that often comes by lots of reading of the Word, meditating on what the Scripture says, thinking about it, learning about it, listening to the audio Bible, listening to preachers and teachers, and staying with it. Amen. So if you want Jesus as the Lord of your life, you want to go in that narrow gate, then simply say this prayer after me, admitting you've been a sinner, recognizing that Jesus died on the cross for you, paid for your sins. He rose again so that you can be forgiven and far more than forgiven, you can be born again and become a whole new creation. The Bible says we're a new person. It's a new start. That's why Jesus calls it being born again. Just simply say this prayer after me and Jesus guarantees that he'll be in your life that your name will be in the Lamb's Book of Life and that you'll be born again right now. Simply say this, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I confess that I was a sinner and I turned from that life of sin. Today, Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Saviour. I confess that you are my Lord and from this day, you are my good shepherd. I will hear your voice and follow you. 
Thank you, Father, that I'm born again. My name's in the Lamb's Book of Life and that I'm a Christian in Jesus' name. Well, Father, I want to pray first of all for those people that just said that prayer and ask that you'll touch them right now, that you'll move in their life and that they will absolutely know that you have changed them on the inside. And I pray, Father, that you would lead them to other genuine Christians who can be an encouragement to them, show them how to get the audio Bible and where to go to church in Jesus' name. Now, I want to pray for everybody else. Father, I pray for those of us who are already Christians, and I pray that you would show us and remind us and bring it as a great revelation what this narrow gateway is all about and the constricted path, and show us every step along the way exactly how to do unto others as we would have them do unto us in Jesus' mighty name. And I pray, Father, for the supernatural grace of God to watch the way you've done it, to watch the way other Christians do this, and to imitate those who do it Jesus' way, to imitate Father, to imitate Jesus, and to watch you in the Word in Jesus' name. It has been so good to have your company today. We so appreciate that you would take out time to connect with God, the lover of your soul. And this week, I can only encourage you to keep reading the Bible, keep encouraging those around you, bless the Lord at all times, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, mm -hmm. for this is the will of God. And remember, we'll be back next week. And in the meantime, I've got teaching online, books that you can buy, and lots of great resources for you. So right now, from David and Rosanna, until next week, it's bye. bye.